everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cat to Vet Tales, where I am talking with feline experts all about the different ways we can keep our cats happy and healthy. I'm so grateful to my friends Royal Canaan for collaborating with me on this catology series, as well as on the Take Your Cat to the Vet campaign. I hope these conversations are eye-opening and encourage you to really stay curious about your cat's health and to schedule regular veterinary appointments for them. Um, you can find this episode and lots more at kittenlady.org slash catology. And today I'm really excited because I'm going to be speaking with someone who I adore. I respect her work so much. Her name is Samantha Bell. She is a cat expert in Los Angeles, California, and a good friend of mine. Uh, she is a professional cat behavior consultant with over 20 years of experience working with cats, and her resume is absolutely amazing. Uh, trainer mentor for the Jackson Galaxy Project's Cat Positive Program, Cat Behavior and Enrichment Lead for Best Friends Animal Society, and she was even a Disney princess, which is pretty amazing. So Samantha, welcome, and thank you so much for joining me today. What a fun <laughs> intro. Thank you so much for having me, Hannah. I am just so honored and excited to be a part of this amazing series. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I hope I didn't put you on blast talking about being a Disney princess, but I just, that's like my favorite piece of Samantha Bell trivia. Um, it's so cool. And it totally shows because you're so um, like bright and like excited about everything that you do. Like your passion just comes through so much. So uh, I'm really excited to talk with you about cat behavior. And, you know, this series is all about um, helping people understand their cat's health. And obviously behavior is a huge, uh, it plays a huge role in their health. So um going to pick your brain about everything, but I wanted to start by talking about something that we all know impacts cat health, which is exercise. Uh, you know, um. exercise can, can really help with keeping a cat fit and, you know, preventing certain diseases and, um, it's important for them to get exercise, but a lot of people, uh, struggle to help their cats have good exercise. So can you just talk about like some, activities that people can do with their cats that will promote good exercise? I can. I would love to. So the one thing, the ultimate tool for exercising your cat, which is also going to provide so many other benefits other than just burning calories, is a wand toy. Mm. And a wand toy is the key to so much in good cat behavior. So here's one right here that has a mousy type Thing on the end of it. Actually, it's an octopus, but it looks to a cat, it looks like a mouse. So <laughs> they've started making octopus ones. <laughs> <That's> like, <cute. laughs> it's a new thing. I had to get it. Um, and I put it on the end of this fun little rainbow ribbon that they also like. So it's kind of combining the ribbon aspect of the wand and a little prey at the end of the wand. And the reason it's so great for exercising, obviously, they are motivated to burn calories because they're doing something they were born to do. A lot of people don't realize that all cats were born to be predators. Even the old cats sitting on the sofa, they were born to hunt and catch and kill and eat and destroy tiny things. So when you're doing this with your cat, you are not only burning calories. And when you're doing it, you want to make sure, make it move like the prey. You know, a mouse wouldn't like jump up really high or fly through the air, try to really get into it and play into that predator instinct and, and drag it along the ground and hide around a corner and just find your cat's prey preference too. Some of them like mice, some of them want to chase birds, and some of them want to chase like little bug bouncy mm -hmm. things. So just really, wand toys are the key here for exercise. Ah, that's so interesting. You know, I, I totally relate to what you said that like, some cats like different types of things. Like um, my cat Eloise loves wand toys and she will like chase after them, especially if they're like bird-like. So the ones that like have feathers and fly through the air. But Coco is terrified of birds <laughs> and she only wants it if it's like a little mouse going along the floor like that. So for her to get her to exercise, I'll like, you know, put it behind me and I'll kind of run with it on the ground and she'll chase it. 
Yeah, that is exactly what we want people to do is it's not about just whatever wand toy you have handy. You want to really work. We need to work to help them feel like predators. So try each kind with them and you can make homemade ones. You don't have to go and buy three different types. Johan's over here. Um, he's come here, bud. He's very excited because all of us. <laughs> he's like, wait a minute. <laughs> That's my favorite toy. <laughs> Um, so, you know, that's great for cats who, you know, are definitely motivated by toys, but a lot of people will say to me, okay, but my cat doesn't like toys or like they're not toy motivated or a lot of people use the word lazy to describe their cats. So what would you say to somebody who says, you know, my cat's lazy or they don't like toys? Well, first of all, I don't know if people realize that cats' bodies are meant to sleep over 12 hours of the day. They need to rest to conserve those calories so that they can burn them hunting prey. So a lot of times people are like, my cat sleeps, you know, 12, 15 hours a day. That's not lazy. That is normal and it's instinct. Mm -hmm. And a lazy cat, when they're awake, if you're saying that they're lazy and they don't want to play with toys, that could be because they're bored and you need to work harder. It's not about your cat being lazy. It's about the human working harder to find something that motivates them. So all cats are going to be motivated by something. Even if they're only motivated by food, use the food to help to get them to exercise. Maybe have them like do a little trail of a couple treats. And when we're doing treats, break them into even tinier pieces than they already are. A cat's stomach is the size of a golf ball. So if you give them three treats, it's going to fill them up right away. And then the activity is over, but break them into little tiny and drop them and have them follow you or put their food in a little X in a little ball so that they have to like bat it and take even just a couple steps. That's more than being sedentary and just sitting and eating from the bowl. So there are ways you just need to work to find what motivates your cat. And um, maybe what you're doing isn't what excites them. So keep trying. Yeah, I love those little balls that have like the holes and then you put the food yeah. in there and I'll put like some food and then some treats. So sometimes they get a little piece yeah. of food and sometimes they get a little treat. Um, I also started doing this thing that I call treat toss where I like take the treats and I throw them down the hall and yep. they will chase the treats like as if they're chasing after a ball. And that's extremely motivating for my cat. That's it, that is perfect. That's exactly what you should be doing because you know they like those oh, yeah. treats. And if you want them to move, then toss the treats. That's a lot when we do training too. Like if you're training a cat to sit, then you can't get them to stand up so that they sit again. You toss the treat so they have to get up and get it and come back. Mm -hmm. So just getting walking to that treat is burning some calories. So you are doing amazing. Oh, life. thanks. Um, what about walking on a leash? Is that good exercise? Is that something that you recommend for people? And also... <laughs> I, you know, I walk my cat Coco on a leash and then people go, oh, well, I can't do that because my cat is already an adult. They never learned. And I'm like, Coco's 12 and she only learned maybe like six years ago how to walk on a leash. Um, so can you give some, some thoughts on leash walking and also uh, some encouragement for people who have an adult cat that they don't believe they can do it with? Yes, any cat can be trained to do almost anything, no matter how old they are. It's all a matter of us being really patient and making the whole thing a very positive experience for the cat. If you start out and you just put a harness on them and set them outside, that is, it's considered, you know, flooding. It's too many things at once, and that is scary, and they may never want to walk again. So you just have not walk again, walk, walk on the harness again. They're just going to lay there. Um, they may never want to walk on a harness and leash again. So you want to start off with something you just gradually build up to it where you might just lie, lay the harness on the ground next to them and then give them a treat. So they see, oh, this thing is cool. When it's next to me, I get a treat. Then maybe set it across their back for one second. That's it. Just one second and give them a treat. So leash walking is something that won't happen overnight. It's something you have to be patient with and be really positive about it. And sessions should only last maybe 30 seconds to a minute and you're trying it and then eventually it's on them. But you're doing this all inside where they're comfortable. And then when you do, when they are comfortable with it, you take them outside, but you want it to be somewhere that is 
safe and quiet and doesn't have you know dogs that could run right by or loud traffic right there. So you want to find somewhere that is the least scary place to try it. And so just everything is about just gradual, little by little, very positive, and just making the whole thing just a wonderful, happy experience. So they see that harness and they're like, fantastic. And, and one thing to remember, once they are walking on a leash, they're not going to just walk in a straight line down the street. A lot of people are like, oh my God, they just lay there. I'm like, yes, that's what they do. They just kind of lay there for a minute and then they'll get up and wander over here and lay down and wander over here. So if you keep your expectations low for what a walk looks like with a cat on a leash and harness, you are going to have so much fun because they do. They just like being outside and they can walk and smell new things, see new things, hear new things. So it's something great that I think everyone should give it a shot. Just do it gradually and positively. Yeah. You know, one of the um, best pieces of cat behavior, like training advice that I got in my life that I try to apply to everything is to always end on a positive note. Like don't wait until it you know, don't wait until they're, they can't deal with it anymore or it's traumatizing to them to stop. Like just do something 30 seconds, end on a positive note, come back tomorrow, you know? Um, so I really like that. That's what, um, when I would teach the volunteers about interacting with the cats at best friends, my little phrase was leave them wanting more, Mm -hmm. always leave them, never get to the point where they're like, I'm done with this enough. And that's just like what you're saying. Like, leave it on a positive note. If you're like, this is going really well. Great. Yeah, stop. stop it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's just great. <laughs> so um, one of the things that I've been talking a lot about with the Take Your Cat to the Vet campaign is the importance of monitoring your cats and kind of noticing changes that might happen. There's a lot of behavioral changes that can occur that people think are just their cat being like in a mood, um, but actually might be a sign of something medical medical going on. Can you talk a little bit about like a cat's demeanor? Obviously we, we all love our cats. We pay a lot of attention to our cats. What might it mean if a cat's demeanor suddenly changes? Like they're usually outgoing and all of a sudden they're hiding under the bed all the time, or they're usually sweet and all of a sudden they're like seeming more angsty or like they're hissing at you. Um, obviously that could be a sign that something alarming is happening, right? Can you talk about that? Yes. Yes. Even though I'm here to talk about the behavioral aspect of this, but with that, when you see any change in behavior in your cat, you take them to the vet immediately. It's not about figuring, being a detective and figuring out the reason for things. If your cat all of a sudden completely changes or even a, a, something noticeable when they noticeably change their demeanor, their um, personality. If if you have a cat that loves to be pet, and all of a sudden you can only get one or two pets in before they swat or bite or do the head flick, or you know if they're getting overstimulated sooner, that could be a sign of pain. It could be a sign of something going on internally, and they don't know how to tell us, but they just don't feel great. So think about like when your stomach hurts or if you don't feel good, you're, you're less likely to want to be active and social and friendly. You just kind of want to, you know, just stay in bed and not be touched by anyone. And they feel the same way. And so if you notice the cat is hiding more or is less affectionate, those are the times when you want to take them to the vet and just always keep an eye on their behavior, especially if you have multiple cats. Because, you know, all of a sudden, you know, I just noticed he used to always be sitting on the couch and I haven't seen him very much in the past couple of days. Just be keeping that on the in the front of your mind to always pay attention because fixing that medical is so important. Um, and a lot of people will say, oh, my cat is mad at me because of, you know, we just got a, a new dog or the cat hates this new bed that we got in the bedroom. And those are really personifying cats in ways that are not accurate and are kind of harmful to the cat because they're not mad at us. They're, they're very, they live a very straightforward life. Their brains are very predator prey. I, I eat and I'm comfortable and they don't really, they're not angry with us and things that people say. There's always some reason that is very straightforward for why this behavior is changing. And it's not because they're jealous and mad and different things. It has to do with either how they feel 
or how their environment mm-hmm. is. So you just want to keep an eye on that stuff and know that it could be a reason to go to the vet if you see that behavior change. Yeah, and that really um, is a great segue into a very important thing I wanted to talk about, which is like inappropriate urination, um, because this is yeah. something I see a lot of people saying kind of like, oh, my cat started peeing on my bed. They must hate me, like you were saying. Um, I even actually several years ago had an, a doctor who reached out to me and said, unfortunately, I'm going to have to return um, this kitten that they had gotten because uh, they said the kitten started peeing inappropriately. And I said, huh, did you go to the vet yet? And they were like, oh, no, it's not. A, this is not a medical thing. You know, they're just they don't like me or they're unhappy here. I was like, please take the cat to the vet, took the cat to the vet. And sure enough, there was a medical issue going on that was able to be cleared up and the cat was able to stay in the home and all was good in cat land. Um, so how common is that? And like, what do you do when somebody tells you that they have a cat who's urinating inappropriately? Like, what might that mean? So I do cat behavior consulting, and that is my number one most common behavior that I'm consulting for. Everybody, you know, there are a lot of reasons that cats are not using their litter box, but I'm telling you, it's not because they hate you, and it's not out of spite. Spite doesn't exist in their brain. <laughs> it is, there's, there's a reason, and there's usually a reason that has to do with either their body or their environment or their box. So it's one of those three things. And and definitely it's not their feelings toward you. Cats are fastidious creatures and they want to be clean and they want to go in the box. So when they're not going in the box, they're telling us there is something wrong and it is either with their health, their box, or their environment. So what you first want to do is rule out their health because what if it is a blockage, a urinary blockage, or something that could be life-threatening? You want to make sure you get them to the vet first when they start not using the box. When as as a cat consultant, when someone says the cat's not using the box, I will not continue working or I will not start working with them until I can see that they did take the cat to the vet and they do have, you know, a urinalysis showing this is definitely not something medical. And even blood work sometimes too, even if it's not urinalysis, it could be something else. I had a cat, I came home from vacation once about 20 years ago and my cat had peed on my bed the whole time. And I immediately, I, of course, this 20 years ago, I didn't know. I was like, she was so sad I was gone. And then I eventually took her to the vet, you know, a couple of days later because she was just looking thinner and she had diabetes and it was causing her to drink more water, which made her urinate more and her body was feeling weird. And so that's how she communicated was like, I, I love this bed and I love this person I'm here. I'm not feeling good. I'm just going to go to the bathroom here. So that's how straightforward they are. So just know that when they are eliminating outside of the box, it very well could be something medical. Once you rule that out, then we start doing the detective work to figure out, is it something in their environment? Is it other cats that are bullying them that you don't even see little tiny microaggressions that you don't even notice the cats aren't letting them get to the box? Or is it um, cats outside that they can smell that they're trying to, you know, just pee everywhere to show this is their house? Or is it the box itself? And then we get into trying all different kinds of boxes and litters and placements. And they're just, there's so much detective work, but you always want to rule out medical first. Mm, yeah, great advice. And I love, I can talk about this. I, one I can tell. And I feel passionately about this too, because I think it does, it makes a big impact on even um, cats being surrendered because people think there's some oh, kind of. Yes you know, behavioral issue, and it really could be a medical thing. Um, I want to ask so you easy to, to, you know, once a cat starts um, going out of the box, like if they um, if they start going on a certain chair, um, they can kind of end up forming a habit of going there. So even after like the mm-hmm. issue has been addressed, whether it was environmental or something with the box or medical, um, Sometimes they can have a habit of continuing to go there. Why do they do that, one? And then two, uh, how do you break them of that habit? 
Oh, that's it's this is one of the toughest parts about the inappropriate elimination, but it is very true and that is very common. So that's a great question. So the number one reason that they're going to keep going there is scent, because there might be a little bit of their scent left in there. And, you know, their sense of smell is at least 14 times better than ours. We could put our nose on there and just be completely certain that the pee is not in there anymore. But there could <laughs> be some that in there. So that is when you get the enzyme cleaners and you do the, the deep clean. Um, between, you know, my last pair of foster, I had foster kittens that did pee under my couch that I didn't notice. And so I got one of those, you know, I rented one of those things to, to really like clean in the carpets and everything and just really focused on that and um, do that. You can do that on the furniture. You want to do a, a deep clean because scent is the number one reason. And then comfort. There was a reason they picked that in the first place. There was something about that that they liked. And you want to figure out what is it about that spot that they liked? Is it the location or is it the... Um, the material, the substrate that they were going on. If they decide to go on my pink velvet chair, which I would die if they were the pink velvet chair. But if a if cat decided to pee on my pink velvet chair, I would get a box and put it near the pink velvet chair with a piece of velvet in oh. it because maybe they like the feeling of that. And you, just that, not even litter, just the open box with that substrate, whatever they were going on. If it's clothes, find an old t-shirt you don't like anymore and put that t-shirt in the box. And maybe that's what it is. And then you gradually add under that substrate a little bit of litter, a little bit more, a little bit more. You never want to put the litter right on top because it's covering that thing they like to go on. Put it underneath like as a surprise and just little by little, you'll build it back to the point where you can get them going in litter again. And you also don't want to put it right exactly on that spot that they went on because if, if, it, if it is a problem with the box, then they're not going to go in that box and then they're going to go somewhere else in the house. And now you've got another spot in the house that becomes a habit. Mm -hmm. And then you're filling the house with spots that become mm -hmm. habits. So you don't want to completely cover it because you'd rather have them just going in one spot in your house than all over it. Um, but put it near it so that if it's the location and not the box, then then they'll go in there. It's tricky. It takes a lot of work. I, I work with a lot of, of clients on this. If you have questions, you can you can hire me. Not hire <laughs> yeah. Me. Oh, my gosh. There's so much to that. Um, I want to move on for a moment to talk about anxiety in cats. Um, you might know my cat Eloise, my little white, my white cat. Um, she is like, or I shouldn't even say it. She was for a time a very anxious cat, and we found um, a lot of ways to manage that for her, uh, which has been amazing. Um, but I wanted to ask you because anxiety is pretty common in cats. Uh, how do you how do you decide when something is like a personality trait and when it is or like a personality or behavioral trait versus something that you would refer somebody to a vet for. So like, when is it like, oh, my cat is just a little anxious and that's just her personality. And when is it like, this is something that you actually need to see like a medical professional? Oh, there's a, a fine line there. And I, what the way I judge this is if it is affecting their quality of life in some way, if it's if it's lowering their quality of life in some way, and this is an example that I have, um, Johan, my cat, likes when he is anxious, he humps his dog stuffed animal. So he has a little doggy stuffed animal <laughs> that I got him from IKEA when he was a baby because he was, um, you know, a little orphan baby, and he would nurse on it. And then as he got older, it's become very comforting to him. And when he gets nervous, and that is usually when I'm on Zoom calls or when new people come over, he he humps his dog. And that is how he, oh, he sees his dog right now. You should see me. You know what? I, I am only laughing so hard because our, our cat has a, uh, we call it his humpy sloth. He has a sloth stuffed animal. Oh no, buddy. Oh no. <laughs> As it slides off the screen. I didn't realize that was an anxiety behavior. His, it is. It's, it's right now I'm talking with you and we're excited. And our, our, you know, our 
energy is high. And so he's like, ah. <laughs> so he needed to get his dog. Wow. And, and it, he takes it and sometimes he just sucks on it. Sometimes he just makes biscuits on it and sometimes he humps it, but it doesn't affect his quality of life in any way. When it's over, great. He's Johan. He's back on, on my lap and he's doing what he needs to do. He's a weirdo to begin with, but I mean, he, he, you know, he's Johan. He's fine. So that is a behavior due to anxiety that I don't think needs any medication. If it got to the point where he was constantly humping and he wasn't eating as much and he wasn't paying attention to his surroundings, he just seemed like disinterested and that was more of his focus, then we would talk about, I would take him to the vet because he might need some anxiety meds for this. Um, so that's that's kind of how I base the the vet decision for that is if it's negatively affecting their quality of life in some way, then you want to like, if they're just licking a plastic bag here and there, yeah, it's not really, not really affecting their quality of life. However, if they become obsessed with it, which they can, right. Yeah. Then that's, that's when that you was something go. that I wanted to ask you about too quickly. We got so much stuff I want to talk about. Ah, um, yeah is like ingesting things around the house. A lot of people say their cat like licks or, you know, chews inappropriately on items. When is that something that can become a medical problem? Well, when they start actually ingesting things that could cause an internal problem, um, we're going to, we're going to talk about Johan again. He had, he's got, he is a mess, this cat. Like I love him to death, but any, any, anytime I do talk on something, there's a Johan story. So he has a chewing cloth because when he finishes eating, he does not like food sitting in his teeth. So he chews on it to get the food out of his oh. mouth. Now, now, if he started chewing on it and ingesting it, it has little strings that could internally, you know, then it's like that huge surgery that's thousands of dollars and it's life threatening. So I would take him to the vet for pica if I noticed that he was actually ingesting it. But it is a weird thing that he does and he loves his chewing cloth. They're so gross. I throw them away. I don't like he gets a new one every couple weeks and it's just this cloth that just has cat food chewed on it. Um, and yeah, he's weird, but that isn't a weird thing. He needs his cloth, and if it isn't there, he will chew something else. He will ch jump on the counter and get a kitchen towel and chew yeah. that. Um, so I, I, I just don't want him to ingest it. So it's basically when cats are doing when they're ingesting something that could harm them. That's when you need to go. The yeah, so it's like important a, to pay attention to those kinds of things, and if they're. If you know you have a cat who likes to do that, then you may have to be careful about the types of things that you leave around. That you leave um, Exactly. I want to ask you about, because, you know, we're talking a lot about uh, the importance of providing regular veterinary appointments to your cat. And one thing that might happen if you're um, working with a cat who is uh, dealing with some kind of illness is your vet says, okay, you have to give them this medicine which can be very scary for people who have never given medicine to a cat. Or even if you have a lot of experience with it, you know, your cat can run away or hide or hiss at you or, you know, just really have an unpleasant time taking medication. And it can be kind of a negative experience for everyone. Do you have any advice on how to make medicine time a more positive experience for both the human and the cat? Do. I actually do. Um, so yeah, you want to sometimes, especially for anxiety meds, if you are giving the meds to the cat to help them relax, but giving it to them is really stressful, then you're just negating the effect of the meds. You really want to give it to them in a way that is not going to be stressful. And it's some, it can be. Uh, Johan loves meds. I put it out and he eats it no matter what it is. But Desmond, my other cat, is really, really tricky to give meds for. So there's a really great way to sort of sandwich it in to make it a positive experience. You want to start out before you give the meds. You want to just designate something to be the meds blanket. And um, like say I use like a really soft blanket they love. You set it down and then on the blanket, you want to prime their senses. So you're going to put silver vine and catnip and feel away one, all three, whatever you can, because their sense of smell is really what dictates how they feel in life. So before you give them meds, you're going to kind of get them feeling really good. So they're smelling these things and they're in a good place. 
then when you give the meds, you want to sandwich it. So I have, if you're giving it to the, in, in the syringe, the liquid syringe, you have another syringe that has cheru in it that you've sucked up. And so then you do a sandwich and you squirt a little cheru, then you squirt the med, then you squirt the cheru. Yeah. So it's, they're, they're mainly tasting is the treat. And then, and then, you know, then they're thinking, okay, something smells good. So they're already calm. And then you're sandwiching that something negative with something positive. And the whole time you're giving treats and you're just making it pleasant, positive, fear-free. Um, Dr. Sophia Yen has some great videos on how to wrap them in a towel in a way that is not stressful for them, where you're just kind of like putting it around them. You're not actually burritoing them. That's that is stressful for them and not good. So you, you want to make it a positive experience, make it loose and light and, and engage that sense of smell and then sandwich it with something delicious. Wow. That is great advice. And I have to say it's very relatable because right now I have to do AM and PM meds for Ferguson, my little um, mm -hmm. kitten who has kidney disease. And I have to pat myself on the back because uh, not only does he like tolerate his medicine, he knows the sound of me preparing his meds and he runs over to the blanket that I do his meds on and sits there and is like, oh, yeah. give me my medicine because he knows that there's treats involved and it's this whole kind of like routine that we've established. And I'm, I think it's so cute. I got to get a video of it because he's just like, oh, it's medicine time. Yay. And I love it so much. It's so cute. I saw a video of you with it in your foot. You had like true in your foot, in your toes, and you were like doing something. That is true. On your yeah. So you've got that true. That's something they absolutely love, and that's a part of it. And and then they will come running. That's amazing. So uh, with the Take Your Cat to the Vet campaign, we're obviously asking people to take their cat to the vet. But something that can happen uh, when you take your cat to the vet that is surprising to a lot of people is if you have multiple cats – one cat goes to the vet, they come back. The cat who stayed home sometimes can not recognize the cat, not, they have non-recognition aggression, they get um, yep. angry when the other cat comes yep. home. Why does that happen? And what can we do to prevent it? Or what should you do if it happens? So that is because somebody ruined the group scent. So your cats have a group scent and, and, you know, they each have their own scents, but they also have the family scent. And somebody went out and they brought, they came back smelling like something else. And it's actually scary for them. They're not angry about it. They're, they're kind of fearful um, about that. And so they might be a little aggressive toward that cat. So one thing you can do is um, have a group scent washcloth. If you know your cat's getting ready to go to the vent, to the vent, <laughs> to the vet, get a group scent washcloth and rub it on their face on all of them, on whoever lives there. And so you've got that little group scent washcloth. And then when that other cat comes back, you want to separate him first, separate him or her into a new room. Don't just throw them in, but separate them and rub that washcloth on them so that you're kind of giving them that group scent before they're introduced back in. And keeping them separate is also a good idea at first because that initial Oh, you know, stress from the cat that is upset by it is going to diminish, you know, minute by minute. But I have helped people who have had cats that were upset for a month when the cat came back from the vet. And so, you know, she did something. She had, you know, the group wash next time she went. She had the group because she knew it was going to happen. She had the group washcloth ready and she said it worked. And he was only upset for one day. That is really cool. I've never heard of the family scent washcloth. I love that idea. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, you want to rub it on their their facial pheromones on the side. Those are their very loving and rub, you know, the ones that they rub on things yeah. that they love. So rub it on faces, like faces and heads and have a group scent watch. Right. Watch. Well, you are filled with great information. And my last question <laughs> that I wanted to ask you is if you can just talk a little bit about cat behavior consulting generally, because Something that I notice is, you know, when people have a dog and their dog has a behavior they don't understand or that they would like to modify, they know, oh, I can, you know, hop on Google, look in the, you know, the phone book, whatever, like find a dog trainer. Uh, but yeah. with cats, for some reason, people don't necessarily realize that they have the option of, of reaching out to um, a professional who can help them. So what is cat behavior consulting? How does it work? 
Um, if somebody's watching this and they're like, oh my gosh, I wish I could uh, pick this lady's brain all day or talk to her about my cat or someone like her, you know, what can people do to get to access this kind of one-on-one -on -one attention for their cats? You know, you just said something and I, it, I, it, a light bulb moment for me when you said they just call a dog trainer and then when there's something wrong with the cat, they don't realize that there's a cat behavior. So it's probably, if you think about it, people know dogs can be trained, but they don't realize that cats can be trained. So you don't think, let's call a cat trainer, because cat trainer isn't a common word, but cats are as trainable as dogs and even easier sometimes. And that's what I am. I'm a cat trainer. So when I'm doing my behavior work, I'm training good behaviors. I'm training them out of the negative behaviors and training them. So I wonder, that's just, I just was like, oh, it's because dog trainer is a thing and cat trainer isn't a thing. And if something's wrong, you have to think, oh, is there a person that does this? There are a lot of us and we can help with all different kinds. I mean, from something so extreme. So I right now am in the middle of a case where uh, husband and wife moved in together. He has two cats. She has two cats. They don't get along. Two haven't peed in the litter box for three wow. years. So we've got four cats fighting and two cats not using the litter box. That's clear that they need help. They need someone. I'm also working with someone who has a cat who she thinks is really smart and he is, and she just wants to prevent him from being bored. Oh, How that awesome is that? I know. And she's like, I just want to make sure I'm doing all I can for my cat. And let's, let's do some training and let's just see what kinds of things we can do to ensure that cat's life is enriched enough. So cat behavior consultants can run the gamut from something that is so dire and extreme that you really need help before before you, you know, think about even surrendering the pet, we can help that. Because that's honestly, that's my goal is to keep cats happy and in their homes. We want to keep them out of the shelters. I've, I've worked in shelters for so long and it is, you know, cats that are struggling and we really want to make sure we do the best we can as cat behavior consultants to keep cats in their homes. And so it's just anything. I mean, if you want to learn how to leash walk your cat, I have someone who is um, disabled and they want their cat to sit on their lap so that they can use their cat um, to do demonstrations. And it's just like the coolest stuff we get to do. So it's basically anything you can think of that you want help with your cat, you can get a cat behavior expert consultant, cat behaviorist um, to help you. And there are even vets that are, uh, cat behavior vets too. That is so great. Yeah. So there's really not like one reason to go to a cat behavior consultant. Like even if you, even if you think your cat is perfect, you can still go to a yeah. cat behavior consultant. Um, so right. how can people, can people hire you or how can people find someone in their area? You know, what are the options? Yes. So I have a website that's samanthabell.org and you can go on there if you'd like to hire me and I do virtual consultants, you know, consultations all over the world. I have, you know, all, all over the place. Um, but also I like to recommend people from the IAABC website and that's International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants. And if you go to their IAABC uh, website and just search for it. There's a map. You can find someone nearby. You can find anyone in the country because right now virtual is, you know, it's, it's just as easy. And um, so you can just pick who you, who you like. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me. I wish we could keep talking all day. You are such a source of knowledge. I really, really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I wish I could talk all day too. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Talk soon. Thanks, Anna. Bye. Thank you, everyone, for watching. And thank you again to Royal Canin for partnering with me on this Catology series and on the Take Your Cat to the Vet initiative. You can learn a lot more at royalcanin.com slash cat health. So for now, stay curious, stay compassionate, and please join me again next week for another fun episode of Cat to Vet Tales. Bye-bye.